Salo for Lava, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Susana Suiswiki. Coming up, the World Health Organization appoints its first Pacific Regional Director. Also, together we've marked a milestone, and I'm confident that this is only the beginning. Miss Global Samoa's success on the world stage inspires the Pacific community. And later on, we tell our with Dr. Dion Inari on why academia needs more Pacific voices. Dr. Saya Maupiukala is in Manila to begin the role of WHO Regional Director for the Western Pacific. It's a big deal considering Dr. Piukala becomes the first Pacific Islander to hold this position. Dr. Piukala's roadmap for his first 100 days in office includes plans to visit many of the 37 countries and areas in the Western Pacific region, engage with governments and other stakeholders, listen and discuss critical issues that impact health, and explore areas for increased collaboration. Alicia Foon spoke with Pacific Health leader Sir Colin Tukuitonga, who was in transit on his way to Manila to advise and support Dr. Piukala during his first week on the job. It's one of six regional directors for the World Health Organization globally, and this is the first time we have a person from the Pacific uh, as regional director. So it's a significant milestone. Um, obviously, we expect him and we will assist him to make the changes that hopefully will benefit small island communities, because I don't think they've had the best uh, support from the World Health Organization because they're such uh, small populations. What are some of the key changes he will be advocating for? Well, I, we talked about this the other day. I think it's important that he strengthens the presence of WHO in the region uh, through offices and more staff, for example, particularly in the north and the Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands, Palau. Even in the south, there's a regional, sub-regional office uh, uh, based in Suva servicing the small islands, but there's so much more that needs to be done. I think uh, WHO should uh, recruit more staff from the Pacific Islands uh, to work uh, for the organization. We have pretty much, uh, or virtually, no one, and um, except maybe one person from the Pacific. So, uh, you know, issues like that for the organization, plus focusing on the issues that are important to the region. For example, uh, health impact of climate change, obesity and diabetes, mums uh, giving birth uh, as safely as possible. We have very high rates of maternal mortality in Papua New Guinea. You know, issues that are particularly prominent in the region. Will WHO be tackling the influence of large corporations like Coca-Cola, big brands that um, might try to influence smaller island nations by... I guess, hosting sports competitions and and school programs and that sort of thing. Will there be any emphasis around the subtle influences of fast food and uh, sugary brands? Yeah, there there already is. I mean, WHO has been working to try to moderate uh, the influence of big food and soft drink companies and tobacco. They've been doing that for years. There's an office in Geneva on tackling what are called commercial determinants uh, of health, alcohol, tobacco, food, and it's clearly a relevant issue uh, for the region. So we're having a meeting with the transition people that Dr. Pukala has selected from some of the member states to talk about what are those uh, priorities, and I expect uh, we will have something to say about alcohol, tobacco, and big food. What advice have you given him? Oh, uh, just generally supporting him through the campaign uh, and the election process, helping him uh, communicate his uh, vision and expectations, uh, advising him on what would be important to member states, priorities for health, staff concerns. The Western Pacific Regional Office in Manila has not had a happy time, so staff are clearly... um, not in a good place and he needs to try to uh, work on that to improve the work, uh, workplace, workforce uh, issues, the type, you know, doctors and nurses and health workers that are needed in the region. Uh, the problem, of course, is um, these are not new things. We've spoken about these before. The issue will be 
how he makes his mark on these chronic uh, health challenges in the region. Samoan fitness trainer and beauty queen Heilani Kurupu made pageantry history by securing first runner-up at the recent Miss Global competition, co-hosted by Vietnam and Cambodia. This is the highest placing a Pacifica contestant has reached in an international pageant. Tian Hexton followed her journey online. Heilani Pelkarupu representing the heart of the Pacific, Samoa! The 25-year-old was among 83 contestants vying for the crown. Heilani is no stranger to the pageant world, as it was in 2022 she was the title holder for the nationally recognised Miss Samoa. However, her participation in the Miss Global International competition makes her the first Samoan representative. Kurupu came second to Miss Puerto Rico, Ashley Melendez. Entering a Samoan candidate for the Miss Global competition was met with reluctance from the Samoan government, but Heilani's achievement of earning a high placing has made her people proud. Heilani Kurupu returned home over the weekend, and a special meeting greet was organised by her major sponsor, Vodafone Samoa. She expressed her pride at being able to come home victorious. I proudly stand here honoured to have made history in the world of pageantry. While the title of first runner-up is an incredible honour, it signifies something more profound, a testament to the strength and beauty of Samoa. Kurupu says she entered the pageant as an ordinary individual and emerged as extraordinary. She dedicated her success to the immense support from the island community. This journey has been a milestone for our Samoan community. This is our victory. Samoa's cabinet minister thanked Ms Kurupu for her passionate representation of the island nation. The finance minister, Honourable Mulipola Onarosa Alemolio'o, said the beauty queen brought honour and recognition to Samoa, saying she has been nothing short of inspiring. This achievement is not just a personal victory for Miss Global Samoa. It is a triumph for our entire nation, a testament to the resilience, grace and talent that embodies the spirit of Samoa. Molio'o says her story will inspire the upcoming generation of Samoan women to chase their dreams. The product impact that her achievement has had on our nation serves as a beacon of hope and inspiration for all our young girls, reminding them that with hard work, they too can achieve their dreams and aspirations. Kurupu hopes her success will inspire future generations to pursue their dreams fearlessly. She invites Samoan women to take on the challenge of representing their country on an international stage. From the shores of Samoa, we can make waves that echo across the world. Together, we've marked a milestone, and I'm confident that this is only the beginning. Heilani Perokurupu's ranking at the Miss Global pageant is a historic achievement, not only for Samoa, but for the entire Pacific. Faftai Telelava Samoa. Thank you for being part of this historic journey. A Samoan scholar wants to see more Pacific people in New Zealand's academic space. Lefawali'i Dr. Dion Inari is a senior lecturer at the Auckland University of Technology and says a stronger Pacific presence in academia allows Pacific people to be fully in control of their region's narratives and history. With the Pacific region continuing to be the subject of interest among geopolitical, climate change and security commentators, Lefawali'i says it's important that the views of Pacific people are taken into account first and foremost. He joins me on Pacific Waves. Malole soi fo la wafiunga Lefawali'i. What drew you to a career in academia? Yeah, well, um, I was raised in Australia most of my life, and I remember sitting in my university lecture hall, and I remember the, a lot of my Palangi lecturers giving me lectures about the Pacific region and, and the islands and, and speaking on the islands as if they were authority figures and they knew more than me about my own region. 
So that kind of pissed me off as an undergrad student. And, you know, I, I kind of had that mentality, you know, be that change you want to see. I don't want to just sit there complaining about it. I need to get in those spaces. And not only do I need to get in those spaces, our other Pacific brothers and sisters, we all, like a lot of us, need to get in these spaces to recorrect a lot of these incorrect uh, narratives that have been imposed on us by a lot of Balangi researchers who research in our region. I'm going to get back to you on that with non-Pacific researchers, but is there a particular field of study or research that you think requires more of our Pacific people, or you just want to see more Pacific people in academia in general? Oh, they, they need to be across the board, across all different sectors, uh, in health, uh, in education, in the STEM, we we need rep- representation right across the board um, to ensure that our our Samoan and our Pacific knowledge systems are implemented throughout all all scopes of research. Yeah. So, if having more Pacifica academics is the key to shaping our own narratives, does that mean their research and expertise should be highly sought after? The reason why I ask this because there's a lot of quote unquote experts that speak on climate change, geopolitics, defense security, and these are the topics that directly affect the Pacific region. And most of the times, these experts are Balangis or non Pacifica, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I absolutely believe um, a lot of our people have unique knowledge and unique point of views that the rest of the world doesn't know and doesn't have because we live right in the region. Our lived experience and our genealogical knowledge that comes through our parents, our grandparents, and our ancestors well equips us uh, when it comes to these issues of of climate change and other issues that affect us within the region and within our own uh, homelands. What's the word? Some of these people speak about us without us as if we can't speak for ourselves. So that's quite problematic. You know, again, any issues that uh, pertain to the region, that pertain to our islands, should be commentated on first and foremost by our own experts. We have many, many Pacific professors, many Pacific uh, doctors and academics who are well equipped to center our our narratives and our and our stories. So I believe you know they should be with anything to do with our region and anything to do with our islands in terms of commentary to the media should be done first and foremost by our own people. Because if we continue, you know, a lot of these Balangi academics speaking about our culture and speaking about us, then it's a continual whitewashing legacy that, you know, that was somewhat sprung up by, you know, the likes of Margaret Mead. And and, and so you have that mentality and you have that that legacy continue if we if we don't start to privilege and honor and, you know, put forth first the voices of our own Pacific academics. Completing a PhD is such an amazing achievement, especially when we see our own people walking across the stage. Was there mm. ever a time though that you received criticism? from our own, about your work? And how did you handle that? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I received criticism from both ends. Right? <laughs> um, but for me, whenever I received uh, critique from our own people, I never took it personally. I I looked at it more of, um, we're, they're very passionate about the work and I'm very passionate about my work too. And uh, to me, it's, checks and balances to see if I'm on the right track as a researcher. So, you know, and and to me, I believe that added to the strength of my work. So, yeah, I was questioned uh, several times in terms of different um, ideas I had in my PhD, especially because my PhD was on the practice of the Samoan culture in Australia. Um, And so then those discussions were had and, yeah, and it all helped and, and moving forward and, and completing the PhD. Um, it's interesting too, my PhD journey, when I look at it, by default, I should never have gotten a PhD. <laughs> um, because along the way from high school right up through university, 
I was constantly told by my teachers and my lecturers that I'll never get a PhD and that, you know, I should aim low, you know, just just be happy to get university entrance. And had I stayed and listened to them, I wouldn't be holding the position that I do now. So even though there's a growth of specific academics, there is still nowhere near enough. Uh, we need um, We need a lot more. So my final message is, if you're Pacific and you're thinking about doing your degree, your bachelor's degree, please do it. If you've completed your bachelor's degree and you're thinking about doing your master's, please do it. And if you're eligible um, to do your PhD and you're sitting on the fence, please do it. Put the doctor in front of your name and come fight with us. <laughs> That's Pacific Waves for today. To listen back, head over to rndi.com slash programs. We're also on Spotify, Apple and iHeartRadio podcasts. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, so far, so far.